Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ingrid Abramovich. I'm the executive editor of El Decor in New York. Uh, I am so thrilled uh, to welcome you to our program today, A House for All Occasions, featuring an incredible project by one of my favorite designers, Ellie Cullman, and her team at Cullman and Kravis. This uh, event is sponsored by ADAC Atlanta and by Julian Chichester. Now, a beautiful uh, video from our sponsor. Welcome back. Um, that was, those are beautiful pieces. So before we begin, I I'm proud to introduce you uh, to my friend, uh, the designer Ellie Cullman. Um, and I'd love to tell you a little bit about her. Ellie founded her powerhouse design firm, Cullman and Kravis in 1984 with her late partner, Hetty Kravis. Um, she's known for her modern traditional style and she's been on El Decor's A-list from the very beginning. And she will always be on El Decor's A-list because uh, we, love, we love her work. Um, she's the author of three best-selling design books and I hear she's working on a fourth. She uh, designs rugs for Crosby Street Studios, has a line of fabrics with Holland and Sherry. Um, and she's also working on a very special collaboration with El Decor, which we're gonna tell you about, give you a little peek at the end of the program. Now, one of the things I love the best about Ellie is how collaborative her firm is. She's got 15 employees. Many of them have been there for a very long time. Uh, they work hand in hand. Ellie, welcome. And uh, I'd love for you to introduce some of your colleagues who are gonna uh, help with the program today and tell us about their work. Absolutely, Ingrid, thank you so much for your generous and gracious introduction. And now I'd like to introduce my amazing dynamite three colleagues who are here with me today. The first one is Alyssa Urban, who's one of the partners in the firm now, and she's been with me almost 20 years. The second is going to be uh, uh, Danny, who has been, sorry, the second is going to be Katie, who's been with us for 10 years. And the third is going to be Danny Mata, who's been with us. She's the newbie for eight years. So we couldn't do what we do without working in teams like this. Now, this is the team uh, behind the project that El Decor ran uh, very recently in our 10th anniversary A-list issue. You can see the cover uh, uh, on your screen. Um, so a few months ago, Ellie sent me pictures of this, of a brand new, just completed project. Um, would we be interested in running it? My colleagues and I looked at the images. We just couldn't believe what we saw. 40,000 square foot ground up home, just exquisite. Uh, every room, a tour de force. I mean, we, within a day, we, we were begging to run it um, and we knew it would be perfect for a 10th anniversary A-list issue. So uh, for this program, I mean, there's so much to show in this, in this amazing project. Uh, we've selected a few rooms and we thought it would be fun to have a virtual tour. Uh, so let's go. Ellie, one, one question that I have is, I mean, where do you even begin with a 40,000 square foot home that doesn't even exist yet? Well, first you begin collaborating with the architect. When we started on the project, he had the basic idea of the floor plan. But then you go from there to all the details, the, the hard materials, the woodworking details. And then, of course, we begin 
at the same time we begin the actual interior design which is something that worked here very well because we worked as a team and um, that's invaluable when you do a project like this so I'd love to ha have us take a peek inside Alyssa Urban is going to begin our tour and away we go Hello everybody, here we are in the main foyer where we have married the design philosophy of the husband and wife of this house. One very traditional and the other contemporary. The elements shown here appear to be a mix of Louis the 15th and 16th antique furniture and a wonderfully beautiful modern art piece on the right by James Welling. Off this foyer is the library. Because the husband is a traditionalist, he wanted a wood paneled room. He preferred lighter wood, so we chose this medium honey stained anagray to panel the whole space. The husband also has a passion for antique rugs. Here you see one of the three antique rugs chosen for the home. This unusual Tabriz rug was helpful in determining the warm, saturated colors of this room. Opposite the library is the formal dining room. Here we wanted to give the traditional room a more modern vibe. We worked with Gracie to design a custom gold wallpaper with large bamboo pattern. This is a modern take on one of their very traditional chinoiserie designs. At CNK, we are obsessed with the details, if you didn't know. So I could not resist showing you this close-up of the dining room curtains. We worked with Maison Lesage of Paris to design this beautiful custom hand embroidered cuff featuring this circular pattern of crystal and metallic beads. This is all hand done in India. That's just exquisite. Um, I, I don't want to forget to mention that um, people, the audience can submit questions uh, through uh, the Zoom. Um, there's a feature on Zoom for questions and answers, and we would love to answer those at the end. Um, now, what, one of the things, I know that this, uh, this couple told you they wanted a house that, that felt like it had been there for 100 years, but yet they're a young family and it had to have all the amenities of home. Um, this space, the living room, I, I, I just find completely exquisite, but it is a vast space. What are the design challenges when you have such a big space like this? And, and, and what were some of the solutions here? So this room was certainly a challenge given the proportions alone. And something that is so important to how a room functions is the floor plan. So here we developed something because it's such an elongated space that we had these two seating groups. So this is great for entertaining, but it's also still warm and inviting. Um, the other elements are sort of the envelope of the space, which includes the rug and the wall treatment. So here's another one of the three antique carpets Alyssa mentioned. This one, unlike traditional oriental carpets, which tend to be overly saturated and sometimes old fashioned, this one is in a really unusual palette, which is these shades of beige, gold, burgundy, and this soft rose. And this really dictated, obviously, the palette for the whole space. The other thing that was a huge design element was the wall treatment. And we get a lot of comments on this for people mistaking it for wallpaper. But you can see in this close up here, it's actually Venetian plaster. And what we've done is layered it with hand applied gold leafing. So it's a very laborious process of plaster and gold leafing and sanding. And it gives this appearance of the gold just melting through the surface of the plaster. That's, that's gorgeous. Um, now I know this family likes to have a good time. Uh, this is the billiard room upstairs. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know how you, find, how you found this antique billiards table. It's beautiful. Um, did you, uh, and, and the room, uh, tell us about the room. Did you match the walls to the table? And what were some of the other thoughts that you had in designing it? Yes, so this room is actually just off the living room. So if you look through that arch doorway, there's a bar and then just beyond that is the living room. So the flow of color is really important from one space to the next. So we took that accent color, the burgundy, and we lacquered the walls in this shiny 
what we call ox blood color. It even has a little bit of gold metallic on the surface that when the light hits it, it's just beautiful. So we knew we wanted to do this color and we found this antique billiards table, which is actually at this warehouse out in New Jersey and they have hundreds of tables just stacked one on top of another. So we found this one and fell in love with it and we refelted the top. So we selected that burgundy to match the rest of the team. Um, and here we are in the great room, uh, which we call the grown up family room. And this room is really all about the palette. And as Alyssa mentioned previously, we typically build the color scheme off of the antique rug. However, in this case, we knew we were gonna do a custom rug. So the color palette was really developed from the fabrics, which is where we pulled this amazing teal color that we blackered on the walls. Um, another interesting feature in this room is the tracery ceiling. Um, due to the 13 foot high ceilings, it was important for us to draw your eye up. So we worked with the architect, James Paragano, and came up with this interlocking square pattern um, that really helps engage this amazing 12 arm ostrich egg chandelier. So now we've been on a tour of some of the public, the entertaining rooms in this, in this home, but this is a young family. I, I'm sure they must spend a lot of time in the kitchen. Um, what, what, what can you tell us a little bit about the, the family areas of the house? Yeah, so this is um, what we call the family wing of the house. It's where the family spends most of their time. Um, this includes the kitchen, the family room and the breakfast room, which are all open to one another. And so here in the kitchen, given the size of this room, it was important for us to break up the cabinetry. So we did two combinations and we have, you can see the white cabinets above a black stone surround around the perimeter of the room with this amazing uh, laser cut mosaic backsplash from Studium. And then in the center of the room, we have two islands of warm walnut with a gray quartzite countertop. And the islands we split up, so you have one that's really the workstation with the sink and it's next to the range. And then the other island is really the informal dining space where we have counter stools covered in a silver vinyl that's easily wipeable. And then in here, you see the two views of the family room, which is really the main gathering space for the family where they're always hanging out. And this is open again to the breakfast room and the family room, excuse me, the breakfast room and the kitchen. Um, so we've carried this color palette, color scheme of silver, black, white, and taxi cab yellow. However, in here, we wanted to pop that taxi cab yellow on the walls to really give a nice reprieve from all the white cabinetry. Um, and then on the right, you can see the built-in workstations where the kids do their homework. And we've covered the furniture in this black and white tweed that's kid-friendly and hides bills and stains. That must have been coming in handy recently. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are in there a lot. Um, and then on the left here, you can see a close-up of the breakfast room, uh, which is another great example of how we like to mix contemporary and traditional. So we have this really colorful Mel Bachner uh, painting that we commissioned of the Ha Ha Ha's that sits above the ebonized Portuguese table that's from 1880. Um, and then through the French doors, you can see into what we call the command center of the house, which is the wife's office. Um, again, we carried the color scheme of the black, silver, and white with this custom silk zebra rug, but we've softened the palette a little bit by doing a pale pink on the walls in Venetian stucco, um, which was the wife's favorite color, and it just gives it a more feminine vibe. Um, and in this room, again, we have the mix of contemporary and uh, vintage finds. It's really a contrast. I think it's very interesting how you've balanced um you know his, his style with her style in the house and i think that that is even uh, more apparent uh when you go upstairs now now we're upstairs uh where the bedrooms are um can you tell me about about the master bedroom yes here we are in the master bedroom and once again as we have mentioned we are combining this traditional and modern style together to please both the husband and wife here you're getting this unexpected modern palette of chartreuse and lavender, which is quite unusual. And we put many elements of antique furniture throughout the space to contrast that very modern 
um, or actually complement that very modern palette. Um, we are always being challenged um, by the client. And one challenge we are constantly facing is where to put the TV in a beautiful room. So here, um, the client wanted to be able to watch the TV from the sitting area on the left and also from the bed on the right. So we came up with a solution that we have decided to call the toaster, um, shown here at the end of the bed. Um, this carved gilt wood cabinet is housing back-to-back pop-up TVs, which is, was a feat in itself. Um, and I give the credit to Katie, who worked on it really hard. Um, the client could not be happier um, being able to sit in the bed and watch the TV when it comes up or sitting on the beautiful lavender sofas um, and watching the TV from that side. So does the TV rotate or is it? No, there are two TVs that are back-to-back -back that yeah. pop up out of this TV cabinet. Um, and amazingly, we were able to carve out a hole in the floor. So we were able to get the TV cabinet low enough that it didn't come above the edge of the bed. In Ellie, um, I, I, we had an interesting conversation the other day about uh, bedroom colors. And you're thinking about that. And <laughs> the, I mean, this is a, a very distinctive, unusual color. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about, about uh, Yeah, I think there's been feeling. a lot of pre color prejudices over the years. When I started in business, people only wanted sort of a blush pink or a peachy kind of uh, wall in their bedroom because it was thought that it made women look more beautiful. But I think at the end of the day, color is so personal. And uh, as opposed to what we saw before the rule, we're breaking it now, just coming up with colors that are exciting and young and fresh. And I think this color is what allows some of the antique furniture in the room to sparkle. And I think it's much more exciting to embrace more than just a, an expected uh, result. What do you call this color? I think it's really a chartreuse or poison green, <laughs> you know, kind of. <laughs> yeah. And then I asked you what color is your bedroom now? My bedroom's been everything, but right now it's a sienna yellow. I spend a lot of time in Florence, Italy. I'm on the board of Friends of Florence, I'm a founding member of the board and I'm obsessed with how all the buildings in Italy kind of go together, all the kind of uh, corals and rust and yellows and I picked one of the yellows for my bedroom. And it's, it's alive and it's fun. We wanna see that in the next Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, so here again, I mean, this is amazing. This is the, the his and hers bathrooms. <laughs> it, 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 it seems like more than that. Each one is like a little palace. But um, I, I think it's a good uh, opportunity to talk about how you did work with the architect on this ground up project and, uh, and you know, use the architecture to incorporate the style that, that the his and the hers each uh, kind of had, were dreaming of. Yes, Ingrid, I would agree. We worked very closely with both the husband and the wife on their um, individual spaces. And here, both bathrooms are extremely luxurious um, with full paneled walls, beautiful slab marble, and each one has radiant heated floors. Um, on the left, you can see that the husband, again, was very, very into his light wood paneling, which is beautiful. Um, in both bathrooms, we do have floor to ceiling French doors that open up onto Juliet balconies overlooking the garden of the house. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, sorry, so back to the husband. He was obsessed with the golden onyx um, that is accented on the sick top and around the edge of the room. So it was wooden onyx for him and very clean lines. Um, and again, 12 foot high ceilings allowed us to have the most luxurious long 12 foot high um, drapery. So we took advantage of that in both rooms. Um, on the right, her bathroom being this high gloss white paint, very fresh, very clean, um, accenting with pinks, very feminine curved ceilings and she loves rock crystal. So we couldn't have enough of that in the sconces and in the chandelier. Um, and of course I have to point out down in the right corner, um, another fabulous detail of this lucite vanity, van, 
vanity chair, sorry, resembling a woman's corset um, that we bought at Liz O'Brien. Um, absolutely love, and we recovered it in a uh, terry cloth fabric, so she could come right out of the shower with the towel and sit on it and put on her makeup at her vanity. It's just a dream. <laughs> Can I interject? Sorry, well, this is a, the same point. Uh, I just want to interject here is that when you work with a couple, you really get to know them very well. And it's also important about how you interface with the architect. So, for example, here we literally changed the size of both of these rooms so that they were basically the same. The husband's closet, the husband's bathroom, the wife's closet, and the wife's bathroom. It was kind of a very fun, competitive thing. And um, you get to know them and really clients become friends. And at the end of the day, in the time while we did this four year project, we did another project for them um, in New York City. And now we're doing uh, an office for him. He uh, bought a carriage house not far from this property, which he's using as his office. And it's fun to be working on a basically historical uh, New Jersey property that's a completely different aesthetic and uh, taste than, than this house. So. so here we are in the wife's dressing room. So as you can see, this Pink was the color of choice again, and this was sort of the epitome of femininity. So we brought in pink kind of everywhere that we possibly could. We did pink mirror in the closet doors on the left, pink silk velvet upholstery, pink embroidered curtains, and even a pink ceiling. And everything in here just really exudes this feminine vibe. We found these deco-inspired fixtures that kind of give off this 1920s glam with the little feather-like glass plumes at the top. And the wife tells us that her young daughter loves to curl up on this double-sided chaise um, and just hang out while her mom gets ready, which is so cute. On the right is the closet proper. So this is a combination of open shelves and closed storage. And we got another hit of the pink velvet with the big poofs. So it is a pretty fabulous closet. So, Finishing off the master suite, this is his office and dressing room, and these spaces are actually connected so he can walk from the bedroom through his closet right into his office. So we wanted these spaces to really feel like they related to one another, both in palette and style. So in his office on the left, we glazed the walls in this sort of bronzy pewter color, and then we inset fabric in the panels, which you can see behind this electric blue sofa. On the right in his dressing room, we did a sycamore wood, which is stained in a light gray. But once again, the colors really complement one each other, complement one another nicely. Okay, and this is one of one of the daughter's rooms. Um, yes. So, oh, sorry. So, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so no, uh, I, I I heard somebody, one of you, use the term uh, catalog couture. What does that mean? <laughs> yes, so we wanted to find a way to make something ready-made feel a little more exciting. So as you mentioned, this is the daughter's room. They have three children and we purchased this four poster bed from Oli Studio and just kind of gave it a total revamp. So we lacquered it in this bright raspberry pink. We reupholstered the headboard and the box springs in a shimmery gold fabric. And then we added these linen bed hangings, which are the fabric's embroidered with these little crystals and rhinestones, so it's super girly and glam. And it's just a really great way to get a lot of bang for your buck, and it looks completely custom. So now, the, I, I understand this house has, um, I mean, it, many rooms, but if you go to the basement, there are some incredible spaces. Um, can, you, can you tell me what sort of it's spaces? A little bit in? about the basement. The basement is a, is a universe onto itself. There is a game room with poker, shuffleboard, foosball. There's a second family room. There's a second children's playroom. There's a large bar. There's a very large wine cellar. Uh, there's an indoor pool, which I'm going to show you next. And most excitingly, they have a full court basketball court downstairs. So really, you could hang out in this house forever, which they did during COVID. Um, here we show the theater where we've done custom chairs and kind of a 
uh, brick color velvet, which we repeated on the curtain that covers the screen. We've also, we also believe at CNK that the more we can make rooms multitask, uh, the more useful it is for a family. So here we have, we've added a small um, elliptical shape stage next to the screen. And the daughter who is quite dramatic, likes to perform at night for family members and friends. We also, yeah. So there's a stage. <laughs> yeah, can you see it? It's kind of in the front yeah. of, it's, it's yeah. shallow. It's maybe only about four feet, but it's enough for her to be able to do her, her shtick, so to speak. So the indoor pool is one of our favorite rooms. And I think here I really have to give a nod to the architect. So many indoor pools are dark and dank, but this one sings with natural light. Notice on the left, we have the French doors that actually have natural light, but we, we worked hard with the architect to reflect them in the panels on the right. They're the same arches, the same uh, fenestration. And so really this room is like a jewel box. It's very bright and cheerful. Um, it also has the same materials from the outdoors. It has the limestone floor and the limestone walls. And we found a contemporary artist to do these very large overscale uh, bird paintings that you see on the right. But I think the most exciting thing for us was coming up with this interesting um, blue glaze that kind of matches the tones of the water in the pool. And when you go into the house and we were just there last week, it looks like the water is flowing on the ceiling, which we didn't know that was gonna happen, but it's very exciting. <laughs> So Beautiful. here we are again outside. And the only thing I want to say is that I'm sorry that we haven't photographed the outdoors when we uh, photographed the house um, originally. The outdoors wasn't done and most of the basement wasn't done either. So this is just a teaser for what we hope to show you uh, in years to come. And I guess I want to just conclude by saying what a great place to shelter in place during COVID. Um, the, the family was really not put upon. They were very happy to be there and each child had a different space to, to study and to play and it really worked out beautifully for them. And they're a lovely, lovely family, which we're so happy to work with. There, if, if you wanna see even more of this incredible house, um, this, the story that was in El Decor is on eldecor.com and uh, you can see it there. Um, but now we have a little preview of uh, something exciting. I, I think, I, I, I'm sure everyone agrees that it's nice to be home, but we're missing um, the cultural life <laughs> that we used to have, just being out there, being able to do things. And one day we will again. Uh, this is a project that we, that El Decor started uh, with Ellie. We're gonna feature it in an upcoming issue. Um, it's a redo of the Hauser Lounge at Alice Tully Hall at Lincoln Center in New York. Um, and Ellie, can you tell us about your relationship with, with Lincoln Center and what you're planning here? Right. Well, I have been on the board of the Film Society of Lincoln Center for a very long time, since the mid-70s, because I'm absolutely a film fanatic. And this is where I hang out every day and night during the New York Film Festival, which is typically when we're open, uh, the last two weeks, in, the last week in September, the first week in October. And if you arrange, which I did, my schedule perfectly, I can actually go to a quadruple feature uh, at the festival. You can start at kind of 11 o'clock in the morning and figure, finish at 11 o'clock at night. And in between the, the screenings, I would hang out in this room. You see the bar, uh, they would serve coffee, drinks, snacks, and you come here after screenings, such as last year we had uh, Parasite and we had The Irishman. You come here after screenings and you hang out with friends, fellow film fanatics, and you talk about the features and all the selection committee wanders through and uh, in and out and also the stars from the show. And it's a very exciting dynamic space. Um, this space kind of needs a redo. The picture actually is making it look better than it is. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> We're thrilled to have this assignment because it, it, this is the smallest reception area at Lincoln Center, but it's actually the gem of Lincoln Center. 
I feel, and it can be rented out by constituents of Lincoln Center as well as corporations and nonprofits. So in designing the room, we had to think about, uh, put all these considerations into effect in our design. Um, and let me just see with this, I'll show you the uh, floor plan next, which shows the seating areas and also what you see, which is really dramatic here through the French tours on the, on the top of the slide, we have an outdoor terrace. And this is literally the only space in Lincoln Center where you can overlook, sit outside and overlook the entire campus of Lincoln Center, including the famous slope lawn that's right opposite us. So we couldn't be more excited about doing this project. And we've been so lucky to work with some of LJ Corps pro, uh, partners on the project. Uh, one of which is Julian Chichester, which you've heard about before. They have been incredibly generous and they're donating these two pieces of furniture for the project, which will take pride of place in our reimagined re uh, Hauser Lounge. I think they're really glamorous and we know they're gonna add a lot to the space. Beautiful. Um, now I, I know that you also, Julian Chichester has, has a new collection for the season. And I know that you also uh, looked, looked at what they have coming up and picked some of your favorites. Can you, show, can you share those with us? Favorites. One is the cloud desk. Actually, both pieces of furniture are homage to Jacques Adnet, the great French designer. And here you see this very cool desk. It couldn't be cooler. Um, it has the leather wrapped legs, which Adnet is famous for. He did a lot of furniture for Hermès way back when. And then also look at the detailing. We have the rosewood drawers, which are outlined in this wonderful light wood. And I think this, will, this is gonna work in many of our projects. Another favorite of mine is the Nico cabinet. What could be more fun than the cabinet, than the combination of these dark red leather uh, pulls against the dark oak frame of the cabinet? I think it's very exciting and again, very useful. We've, we're hoping actually to use this in the owners uh, of the house, the house that we discussed in his office. I was thinking both of them would be perfect. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> okay. Um, so we do have questions coming in, but I, I have a question for you as, as a film buff, which you seem to be, um, can you recommend some of your favorite movies for design? Uh, well, you know, it's so funny. I was asked to write about that recently, and I picked the Tom Ford movie with um, uh, Amy Adams, where remember she had, I'm blanking on the name right now, but she had that amazing gallery in LA. Um, she had the most amazing clothing. It was really, you remember it started with all these naked women blubbering around on pedestals. And I just think how Tom Ford put it together was, it was oh, Nocturnal Animals. Sorry, that's the name of the movie. But then I'd like to go back to all the old 30s black and white movies. I think those have had tremendous influence on me as a designer. Um, you know, Grand Hotel, all those, all those sort of like 30s black and white. You know, if, here's the thing. If you're in design, everything you do affects what you do in life. And for us, very important has always been travel. Unfortunately, right now, travel is very curtailed, and we've actually been quite worried with all of our new projects because we're not exposed to everything that we see at all the art fairs and all the, the, the antique fairs in, in Europe and the, the French flea market. So much of this project came from the flea market. Um, the owner came with us to Europe twice, and we were just like high on furniture is the only way I can describe it. We miss it. Yeah. We really miss it, right, Ellie? Yeah. We miss it. Beyond. Yeah. It's a completely different way of working. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So, so okay. you're, looking, yeah. you're looking to things like movies for, to feel, to get some inspiration? Yeah. I mean, a little bit of everything. To me, a house is best when it's a combination of antique pieces, vintage pieces, and also custom-made pieces. That's what gives the depth to a design and the character. I can't imagine just going on, and I think my colleagues all agree, we can't imagine just going online and picking 
some stuff. It'll be very helpful to know it's out there, but I like to go and see it. And we're very grateful that all the showrooms in New York, although on a limited basis, have reopened. It's very important to see it and to imagine how it all looks together. Okay. Well, I have questions rolling in. And okay. uh, audience, please, please feel free <laughs> to send questions. But no, here are some of the ones that I've, we've been receiving. Um, one person loves all the yellow in the house. Um, I did notice that gold, but also, you know, taxi cab yellow in the, in the kitchen. Um, how did you come up with that? Or is that just something that the family asked for and loves? What would you say, Alyssa? I think more than yellow, I think we were really interested in shiny surfaces so that there's a lot of metallic in the house. There's a lot of metallic. There's also a lot of um, animal prints, you know, our, the owner yes. who we adore never found, never found an animal print that she didn't love. <laughs> and it kind of, Very true. Yeah. So yes, she, yes, she likes yellow and her other house. It's interesting. Her other house was yellow, her previous house. And she said to us, I don't want to replicate the house. So for the old house. So for example, in all the transition spaces, you see the bark paper, the natural kava paper that we used, it basically has a silver tone. So it was a completely different transition space in this in this installation. But guys, do you want to? Yeah, no, I would say that I would say that the clients loved all the colors and really wanted to make sure that we didn't repeat a lot of the same color in one area. I mean, if you kind of think about it, the whole house, every room sort of takes on its own character, and I think it's pretty apparent, as we said throughout this whole. Um, talk that this contemporary feel that the wife really loved and the very traditional feel that the husband wanted and I think melding them together was a fun challenge for us and at times difficult because we wanted to make sure you know we made everybody happy so um, I think the color palette kind of spans the wheel um, in a sense. I agree I think it spans the wheels and also pleased everybody we only showed you two bedrooms and there are 10 bedrooms. So I can only say that when we were, you know, we do something in our office called I love it, I hate it. So when a client comes, we, after we've heard what they like, what they don't like in general, we have an I love it, I hate it meeting where we throw a million things at them and they say yes, no, no's get thrown on the floor, yes get put on the counter. And then it's our job to do the psychological testing of how this all goes together. And that's one of the greatest journeys that I think we take with people is not only the specific, but to the general and the flow from room to room. So if our slides today look really yellow, honestly, I promise there's <laughs> every other color in the house that you can think of. Um, there were a lot of colors. <laughs> Lots of colors. We also had the other project we were doing for them at the same time. So we had to differentiate from that family room and that living room. So wow. we really tried to go across the color wheel. Yeah. Okay, another uh, member of the audience says, this house is a dream. Is there one room in particular that posted the largest challenge? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I would say, unfortunately, we didn't have a photo of it, but <laughs> the lower level was just this massive expanse of space that was relatively open to all the adjacent spaces. So I think we laid down the rugs and a pile of fabrics for weeks trying to figure out what are the sofas, what are the chairs, and we had done a living room, a great room, a family room, a playroom, a loft. So we had all of these other iterations of a living room that we had already schemed. And so it was trying to come up with this new recipe that was also going to work off of a theater and an arcade and a this bar we he wanted the whole thing was kind of inspired by the Hemingway bar in Paris so we knew we had this palette of kind of green and bronze and chocolate brown but it was a challenge I would say. <laughs> How long did this all take you? Four, four years. Four years. Four years. Four years. It was yeah. ground first, up. Meeting, first meeting to installation was four years. Wow and is it the biggest <laughs> project you ever did? It's one of the biggest certainly in one the top five. Okay. Um, but we'd love more. <laughs> it's nice uh, so someone else is asking, where do you begin when you start a new project like the Hauser Lounge? Where do you find your inspiration? 
Well, we do the floor plan. The floor plan is always first, and then we come up with the palette. I don't think you could see in the photograph, but there's a very um, significant wooden wall in the Hauser Lounge that's quite it's not a cheek, but it, it's a, some kind of Brazilian wood or something. Yeah, it's like a cherry, like a red cherry wood, right, Ellie? Red cherry wood. And of course, the Lincoln Center campus that you're seeing through the windows is very white and gray. So I think that's the first thing that we had to confront was the wood, which is landmarked apparently now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the wood and then the, the surrounding environment. I also think that for for us, we you know we tend to have a client and we try and we work through what the client wants and needs. Here, we're trying to meet the needs of the Lincoln Center group and the Hauser Lounge, but also wanting to have appeal for when other people come in to actually rent and use the space. So I think it adds a level of challenge, Ellie. Would you say to um, you know? What we'd really probably do as opposed to you know you can't go as and wild well, and crazy as you want. I would have liked to and there right. were other logistic considerations I mean the sofas could not be bigger than a certain dimension because they wanted to have the stagehands and the porters be able to put them in the elevator. Sometimes people rent this space out and they empty it completely and they fill it with dining tables for 100 people so and then, for example, the coffee tables, think about it. Most coffee tables are pretty heavy because they have glass or they have marble. This was not allowed because, again, you know, they, they, they didn't want to hire, you know, the people who moved the sets at the Met. Too expensive to change the room out. So all these considerations added to how we came up with the design. And because we always work in teams, every one of the team has a very strong opinion. <laughs> so... When in a good way. In a good way. Is another cook in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So we, we um, know that if we all love it, it's good. And if somebody has a strong aversion, forget about it. You know? We have a lot of questions rolling in. So oh, I want to keep moving. Um, someone's asking about the art in, in the New Jersey house, which is such a big part of, of the project. And by the way, I didn't know that you could commission a ha 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 painting from Mel Bachner. Now know. I know. It's, it's, or maybe maybe you're special. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. We have to tell you that we did work with an art advisor on this project because it was too large for us to do on our own. It's too gigantic a financial consideration. But with the exception of just a few things, almost everything in the house is an emerging artist. We're very lucky. We work continuously with a woman um, named Rachel Goulding, who I have known since she was in college. And she's kind of like a genius. What I love about her is that we, she knows everything. But what she does is works with the designer. We've had some very unfortunate situations over the years where a client will pick some fabulous art advisor from Europe who doesn't care how the art looks in the space. I had one client in the Sherry Netherlands Hotel and literally the art advisor put what looked like a cell phone over the bed. <laughs> and I, not only was it terrible because it was vertical over a, a king size bed, but it looked insane. So what we love about our dear friend Rachel is that we work with her on every elevation. And needless to say, on a four year project, you start with an artwork in one room. Later you find something else for that room. You have to know where you're putting it. So we're constantly working with um, the elevations and where things go and, um, you know. Ellie, there was, we could talk one quick thing about the, yeah, the challenge, yeah. and I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, but the contemporary art compared to the traditional easel paintings that the husband is in love with and wants to have, but you have these huge ceilings, right, that were challenged to fill spaces over mantles and these little easel paintings just don't, hold the space the way these larger contemporary pieces. So we're, well, they're again, they're having, yeah, no, they're having lessons and learning what they like together that work for all of the elements needed in the house, right, Ellie? Well, there is another consideration too, which I have to mention, which is hard, hard word to use about this house. But the other consideration is budget. The truth is that all the small, like 19th century easel pictures or, you know, first early modernist pictures are incredibly expensive compared to buying emerging art. 
which is a fraction of the cost. So for example, in the husband's library, we found a painting by George Innes from the end of the 19th century that was actually the physical manifestation of an area right near their house. So it's amazing. It, having the mix allowed us to not totally break the bank. So it was good. It, so it was all acquired for this project? Yes, every wow. single piece, except for he had a, he's Italian, of Italian descent. He had a baptismal font that he had bought in Florence. He had a pair of angels, sculptures, Guys, that's it, right? And the Deca a couple drawing. little easels, yeah. Oh, sorry, a Deca drawing. drawing and a. Uh, Deca, wow. All right, somebody's asking me to do a round of uh, a lightning round questions. <laughs> They're hard. I'll okay. Go no, so, <laughs> no room is complete without a uh, Ellie. Well, good lighting. I mean, I could talk about lighting forever. It doesn't matter how beautiful your design is, if the lighting stinks, forget about it. Alyssa. Throw pillows. You gotta have beautiful throw pillows. Okay. Katie. Um, a well-placed television. <laughs> Danny. Art. Art, okay. Um, the first place you are planning to travel when you can, Ellie. Oh, I wanna go to the flea market. There's just amazing finds there and so reasonable. Alyssa. Germany and then the flea market because my husband's German. I got it. We got to go back home. So. Uh, Victoria and Albert Museum in London. I'm really missing that. Annie? We had to cancel our honeymoon in Portugal, so we're going back as soon as we can. Okay. Um, an old fashioned look you would love to see make a comeback. Ellie? I think we can start using chintz again, but we have to use it in a more modern way. We can't, you know, line the walls and the curtains and the bed skirt. You know, I think we can use it sparingly because it, having something that's curvilinear and multicolored is important in design, I think. I don't think we should eliminate anything, basically. And Alyssa? Wait, she stole mine, Ellie. Uh, We've been um, working together too long, 20 years, that's what happened. Um, I feel like we've done less stencil walls than we used to in the past, and I think we could bring more stenciled walls back. Okay. Can we Katie? Do that book art too for me? <laughs> um, brown, brown furniture, I hope, makes a big comeback. <laughs> and Danny? I love that. I love a good moss fringe. I know sometimes they pop in on a pair of pillows or something, but I think it's a fun, it kind of looks fresh again. It's sort of that what are they calling it? Grand millennial thing that's coming back. That's definitely coming back. <laughs> um, another question. How do you find a balance between not being repetitive throughout the house, but making everything flow and feel cohesive? I mean, that is really a challenge in, in a house that large. It's our job, right? <laughs> that's our job. I can't describe it any other way, right? Yeah. I mean, I think having four years to do it and really working closely with the team, with the client, and feeling that we've touched on every, as we've said, all the details are hugely important to us. So I think knowing the details and making sure they flow throughout the house, whether it's color, whether it's shiny gilt wood, anything crystal, I, I feel like those things your eye gets drawn to throughout this house, wouldn't you guys say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, we, we're do, when we were doing the logistics of the installation and tallying up things for the lighting schedule and the movers, we had like 130 decorative light fixtures and like 28 sofas. So it was just the sheer volume of what we were pulling together and to not use the same flush mount twice. We, we pulled it off somehow, but it was a lot of moving parts. <laughs> and I, I, we will admit, right, because nobody's perfect. When we got there, the lamp that might have been placed, you know, picked for the living room ended up in the family room or a sofa that was going to be facing the fireplace ended up sideways facing the outside. So I think being flexible within the space also really helped. Didn't, didn't you have a story about how you had a floor plan and then you got in there and <laughs> rearranged everything? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Was that the living room? That yes. was the living room, yes, where we, we actually had a sofa that was cutting off 
um, half the room and facing the fireplace in the living room. And when we got there, we said, you know what, we're not liking that in the middle of the room. So we ended up putting it um, parallel, parallel to the fireplace, perpendicular, sorry, to the fireplace <laughs> and facing it outside. Um, and the room just opened up and felt better once we were in it and moving things around. We do that all the time. We then get Ellie to come in and she runs around and moves things around too, right? And I <laughs> <laughs> okay, most designers begin with a rug and design from the bottom to the top. Somebody's, this is a question. Were there any spaces you started with a different piece? Hmm. Katie said before, you know, we start with the rug if it's an antique rug. And if it's, uh, if, it, if it's a room that we start with a fabric that the client loves or wall covering, then we start with that and then go from there. So really, and I think it's important to have a different recipe also for every room. If not, it looks very formulaic. So it's either yeah, there was, there was one fabric in particular that we fell in love with. It was the, uh, from Claudio, I'm blanking on his company name, but it was this atelier, like- Atelier, Atelier. Yeah, yeah atelier, atelier Modern. Modern, yes. And it was like this kind of Chanel looking suiting tweed that was orange and yellow and black and white and we were obsessed with it and it sort of kicked off the palette of the full like kitchen family room breakfast room and then we ended up with like one lumbar pillow in the window seat in that actual fabric but it kind of was the catalyst for the rest of the scheme so even a little pillow can be yes <laughs> um well, somebody was asking me i'm oh, sorry i was gonna say sometimes i bring clothing I, I never throw out a piece of clothing. So sometimes I bring clothing to the office as a catalyst for a color scheme for a room. So right now we're working on a rug for an apartment uh, on 72nd Street that's coming off of one of my vintage blouses. So. <laughs> we, we did a scheme off of one of Ellie's Pucci skirts one time also, right? So you never know. <laughs> Somebody's asking if, the, if you did any decorating in the basketball court. The only thing, not really, but the only thing we did do was the client had a bunch of basketball jerseys and he asked us to frame them and mount them and then we had him hang them around the upper level because it is a full basketball court so they hang all around the upper level. So we had a, li a little bit to do and maybe we picked out the blue padding. I think we picked that it was, yeah, the yeah I think blue padded, padded walls. walls. <laughs> Isn't that the football team that he likes that is royal blue? Right? He's green. Uh, he's an Eagles fan. Yeah. Eagle, he's green. <laughs> okay, I, I think I have time for two more questions. Um, somebody's asking uh, <laughs> that in, in their words, what's a beast place? Oh, the best place. Okay. I thought a beast, like challenging, <laughs> a flea market. Oh my God. <laughs> what's the best place to shop for antiques and vintage pieces? I'd say the Paris flea market, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, there's all the antiquing on the Carré in Paris, which also has a wide variety of stuff. And we also go to London very often, too, in Italy. And, uh, any and when we do, we also go to, out to Stamford, Connecticut to all those dealers. So, I mean, there, is, there are places where we so don't have to get on a plane, but we'd like to get on a plane. So, so basically, we love to shop. What we hate is paperwork. <laughs> Are, are the Paris, are this, the uh, stalls in the Paris flea market on, online or can you get things right now? I think so. I don't know. I'm not sure. There might be a, a couple that have an online presence, but I, I mean, there's so much there that I can't imagine they have it in any organized way that we could shop. We should look into that, actually. I know. That'll be better because I don't think we're going anywhere. Google Maps and figure it out. Maybe one day. <laughs> um, Ellie, who is your dream client? Like the owner of this house. I mean, we love them. Somebody, somebody who respects us the way how we respect them and how you go on a journey together. What I don't like is preconceived notions. It's a journey. It's a meeting of our aesthetics and their aesthetics. And that's the fun thing. If we knew how it was going to turn out at the end, I would wouldn't be working anymore. It'd be so boring, right? So that's that's my dream client. And we've had many, many over the years, but this was one of our favorites. Well, 
this has been, this is amazing. Uh, I really, really want to thank you, Ellie, Alyssa, Katie, Danny, the whole team. Um, I would love to thank uh, ADEC Atlanta for hosting this presentation. Julian Chichester, of course, I would love to thank. And also um, to all of you people who we can't see, the audience, you're in, you've been amazing too. So many great questions to keep rolling in. I hope I got to most of them. Uh, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Have a great thank evening. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.